Welcome to the second set of notes about classifying matter. Let's get started. Here's the essential question. How do we classify matter based on its phase or state? Well, before we talk about that, let's review what we talked about the first time we were learning about classifying matter. Here is a bottle of water. If we wanted to classify this piece of matter based on its composition, we would first need to decide whether it's a pure substance or a mixture. Now, at first glance, it might seem like it's a pure substance because it has water in it, and that might seem to be that they're all there is. But if we actually look at the label, we see that there's more in this water than just water. This is mineral water, so we get different minerals such as magnesium sulfate and potassium bicarbonate. So this is a mixture. Now we can further classify this mixture as either homogeneous or heterogeneous. Well, if you look, this water is fairly uniformly mixed. Those minerals in there and the water itself aren't clumpy. They're taking up the entire container and they're uniformly mixed. So this is a homogeneous mixture. Well, let's contrast this to distilled water. So here is a different jug of water. Let's see what its composition is. Well, this one is distilled water. It's made by pulling all of the impurities out and just leaving or pulling out just the water itself. So this is a pure substance. Now, water is not an element because it's made of more than one type of atom. It's made out of hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. So distilled water is a compound. Now, we can even further classify this as either an ionic compound or covalent compound. In this case, water made of hydrogen and oxygen, those are all nonmetals, is a covalent compound. So there's two different examples of classifying matter based on its composition. Now, we've been talking about water for both of our examples. Is there a way we can classify water differently? And here, I'm going to give you a hint. Take a look at these three things right here. Now, you might be familiar with these three things, solid, liquid, and gas. Those are phases of matter, and that is another way we can classify matter. Now, a phase, when we talk about phases, examples are solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, and there's actually more phases than that. But what exactly is a phase? A phase deals with the kinetic energy and the intermolecular forces of the particles. So let's delve deeper into that. Let's start with kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is just the speed or the movement of the particles. Take a look at the three main phases of matter, solid, liquid, and gas from left to right. On the left-hand side, this is what we would see if we were to zoom in on a piece of solid matter. You'll notice that the particles are very tightly packed. We say they're more dense. Um, they are moving, but their movement is low. It's kind of slow, mostly wiggling and jiggling. They don't really flow around each other, each of the particles. In the middle here, we have a liquid. Now, notice that the liquid, after having a little bit more movement, is able to flow around the pieces of matter in and of itself. It causes it to be a little less dense. And I like this picture here because imagine we're looking at the side of a container, the liquid itself is actually uh, affected by gravity and is even being pulled towards the bottom of the container. Now, the last one on the right-hand side is a gas, and gases have particles that have very little density. Uh, there's lots of movement. The particles are moving around quite often. Now, I'm looking at all of these in terms of movement, and I think they're all slowed down, but you can at least see movement relative to one another. Now, the one we haven't talked about in the last slide is plasma, and I don't have an animation for this, but you can kind of see over here on the left-hand side what plasma looks like. If you were to give a piece of matter a ton of kinetic energy, those particles start to move so fast and so chaotic that they is essentially rip apart each other. The particles rip apart and ionize, meaning that they become separate positive and negative charges, and we create something called a plasma. Now, a plasma isn't a common phase of matter on Earth, even though it's one of the most common phases of matter in the universe. An example of a plasma that we do see on Earth is lightning. Lightning is a form of plasma. It has separate ionizing charges, which is why it's able to act like electricity 
So phases can go through phase changes. We can change from one phase to another by adding or removing energy, now, typically in the form of heat. So if we add or remove heat energy, we can go through various phase changes as you see here on the right-hand side. Now, enthalpy over here, as you see, is just another word for heat. So as we increase the heat of the system, we can change various phases from solid to liquid to gas to plasma, and almost anywhere in between those phases. Now, changing the amount of heat energy also impacts the intermolecular forces, which also deals with phases. So let's talk about that next. An intermolecular force, or IMF, is the force that holds two or more molecules together. Now, we're not talking about the bonds that hold the atoms together. This, for example, is a covalent bond of water, which is a very strong bond. What we're talking about is the bond that holds one water molecule near another water molecule. These are intermolecular forces. Now, these forces are weak forces. They can be broken apart. And they're caused by these things called dipoles, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, just to give you an analogy, I always like to think of atoms and molecules like the building blocks of matter, kind of like Legos. Now, this is a Lego in and of itself. This could represent an atom or a molecule. And we know that Legos are made of plastic that are really tightly fused together. That's like the ionic and covalent bonds that hold itself together. But we could take one Lego and kind of, we could snap it together with a weak force. And that weak force is my analogy for intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the forces that hold all of our different atoms and molecules together so we can create anything we need, or the universe can create anything it needs. So let's talk about those dipoles. How do intermolecular forces occur? They occur because of dipoles. Now, a dipole is just a positively charged end of a molecule, and that's caused by an unequal sharing of electrons. Take a look over here at my example of hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid. Now, hydrogen and chlorine stick together covalently. They technically share electrons, but we're going to learn now that they do not share those electrons fairly. Take a look at where the electrons are in this molecule. They're kind of hanging out near the chlorine more than they are the hydrogen. The chlorine's kind of tugging those electrons a little bit more. And that's because chlorine has a higher electronegativity or electron attraction than hydrogen. So even though they're both technically sharing those electrons, chlorine's kind of sharing them a little bit more, kind of sharing them a little bit less, I guess, and by pulling them onto itself. Now, what happens here is chlorine then becomes partially negative charge. You see here this delta negative right there, that's the Greek letter delta with a negative sign, it just represents that chlorine on this end has a just a slightly negative charge than it should. Um, likewise, hydrogen having slightly lost those electrons has a partially positive charge represented by this delta positive over here on the left-hand side. Now, we learned about electronegativity a long time ago when we talked about the periodic table, but here is the trend of electronegativity. So we can use the periodic table to see which elements will tug on electrons more than others. Now, this leads me to a concept called polar and nonpolar bonds. Now, a polar covalent bond, like you see here with water and with our last example of hydrochloric acid, are covalent compounds that have a distinct overall, di overall dipole. So for example here, water, a lot like hydrogen chloride in our last slide, has a partial negative end, that's the oxygen, and a partial positive end, that's this, these two hydrogens. Imagine that there's a dividing line right down the middle here. You can have a distinct one side of the molecule being negative and the other side of the molecule being positive. Those are polar covalent bonds. Here's an example of a nonpolar covalent bond. Here we have two fluorines. Now, according to their electronegativity, they both have equal pole on those electrons. They're both attracted equally to those electrons. And so there's no partial positive or partial negative because they're pulling pretty evenly here. Now, another example of a nonpolar compound is carbon dioxide. Now, these molecules or these atoms within the molecule do have dipoles. Notice that carbon has less of an attraction than the two oxygens on either end. Now, 
even though this does have dipoles between the carbon and the oxygens on both ends, the molecule in itself is not polar because there's no distinct one side that's positive and one side that's negative. You can see that positive kind of pulls in the middle and negatives kind of pull on the outside. Um, it's kind of like a tug of war where nobody's going anywhere. So this is a nonpolar compound because it's kind of evenly distributed between the positive charge and the negative charge pulling in opposite directions. Now, why are we talking about polarity? What does this have to do with classifying matter? Well, you remember we talked about mixtures such as heterogeneous, homogeneous mixtures. Polarity is helps determine the solubility or the dissolving ability of a substance. Take a look at this oil and water down here. You probably are, remember or recognize that oil and water don't mix. And a big reason for that is because they are opposite in terms of their polarity. Water is a polar molecule and oil is a nonpolar molecule. Now there's a rule that says like dissolves like. Polar substances will really only dissolve in polar substances and nonpolar substances will only dissolve in nonpolar substances. So if you put a nonpolar substance with a polar substance like oil and water, they don't dissolve. All right, so that leads us to the end of classifying matter. Take a look here at both ways of classifying matter. If you haven't done so, I might take a moment and draw a picture of the different phases of matter and what they look like, um, as well as labeling the fact that from if we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas to a plasma, we have more kinetic energy and weaker intermolecular forces. But the next time you see a piece of matter, see if you can classify it not only on its composition, but also based on its phase. That's the end of the notes. Good luck.